Easter happen without anyone actually being there, at least to witness it on the spot, at least not at the very moment when death was overruled by life. No one saw the stone actually being pushed away from the entrance of the tomb. No one saw Jesus, or was it God, unwrapping what for a time had been a corpse. And in fact, Mark tells us that by the time the three women who were the first to get to the tomb arrived, all these things had already happened. And even though Christ had risen, the sun had yet to peek up over the horizon. Today, we are experiencing life after that sunrise. The Son of God has risen, just as he had said. And so too, the sun has risen in the sky, spotlighting an empty tomb, amplifying the fact that when God is involved in our lives, death does not have the final word. Now in Mark, there is a, a bit of a scholarly debate when it comes to the last word of that gospel. Because the oldest manuscripts, meaning the reliable ones, the most reliable ones, all end with verse 8. More recent manuscripts, however, possibly written after the fact, have an additional 12 verses to them. What's interesting is how those two versions end. The 12 newer verses conclude with the words, the disciples went everywhere and preached and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they'd said by many miraculous signs. It seems everything and everyone is doing exactly what we would have hoped after the resurrection. But if, however, you stop at the ending given in the oldest manuscripts of Mark's gospel, well, you're left with a very different message. The last words of verse 8 are, the woman fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were terribly frightened. Now, I like the fact that in most of the versions of the Bible that we hold in our hands today, both endings are included, whether they're in the text or the footnotes, because there are days when our own responses to the resurrection resemble one or the other of these endings in Mark. I mean, some days we eagerly and bravely want to tell the world about the faith that stirs within us and gives us hope. And then there are other days when we are far less eager to tell anyone, anyone that we even go to church or have a faith of any kind. Like the closing words of verse 8, we say nothing because we're too frightened. Frightened perhaps about looking foolish or not fitting in or sounding like lunatics. The Bible, however, assures us of the long history behind both of these responses. Fear and silence, boldness and proclamation. They all continue to characterize the church through the ages. But we know which of the two has kept it alive and growing despite all efforts to extinguish the flame or discredit it. Do you know that there remains a more accurate and expansive literary record of the things that Jesus said and did in his day long ago than there actually is of the works of Shakespeare, which are written down some 1,500 years later? Why is it we're not embarrassed to tell our friends about the plays we've seen in Stratford, but, but somewhat more reluctant to talk about the acts of the apostles or the drama or message of Jesus? or perhaps where we spent an hour just last Sunday. I suppose it has to do with whether that day I'm a verse 8 or verse 20 follower of Jesus. I'm Craig Rumble. Thanks for being together with Markham Baptist Church. <laughs>